around a little bit. <clears throat> Didn't he, Brother Scott? Now he's forced to eat Mama Scott's cinnamon rolls. Amen. So you, you just hit them over, Brother Dan. Well, if I can get to them. Because I got the cinnamon monster over here. And she said she wants the recipe, but she's afraid to get it. And I don't know if we can afford her to get it. I don't know if she'll be in there eating them all night long. <laughs> They're good, I tell you. We're glad. God's good, isn't it? I'm going to try not to hold you long tonight. But I want to go to St. John chapter 2. This is my second message today that I studied out. I wanted to preach on something else tonight, but when I saw several that were going to be missing, uh, I thought it would be better for me just to wait until Sunday to preach that message. Not that you didn't need it. Everybody in this house needs it. We've got several here that I think would really benefit from the message, but I want as many here as we can. Uh, give me a little bit more time to finish it out, too. But I want to preach this right here to us tonight. Uh, St. John chapter 2, if you have that, say Amen. <clears throat> And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, uh, these six water pots, in case I forget to tell you in a little bit, uh, they could hold anywhere between 100 and 160 gallons of water. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. He saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that was his words. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Save the best for last, he said. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I want to make a little clarification here. I think one time I told you some maybe years ago, a couple years ago, that I wasn't for, for certain if this was actually the first miracle he performed or the first one that we have uh, listed. Well, tonight I believe it was the first one. He performed. And the reason I say that is because over here, uh, you flip the pages, a few pages, and he'll tell us who gave it. It's his second one that was performed. And so I was just trying to exalt him in my zeal there. I may have uh, brought the wrong fact about that. But I want to pray tonight that God would help us. And I want to preach tonight on, on Christ changing the water into wine, all right? Father, we love you. And we thank you for all that you've done, your many blessings and the grace that you've poured out upon us, the mercies and compassion. Thank you for the precious saints that are here tonight. We've got several missing, some sick, some afflicted in their bodies. We ask you to touch and heal them. Others, their spirit and souls are not where they need to be with you. We ask you to touch them. But Father, here we are tonight. We came on out to the house of God expecting you to speak to us and help us. We thank you for the song service. I felt your spirit and your presence, and I need your help too. I ask you to help these precious saints as, as they hear the Word of God, that it would change them, even as you turn that water into wine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, it's a good book right here. This Bible. This book of John, one of my favorites too. Jesus changed the water into wine. Uh, I think uh, two of the most uh, amazing characters in the Bible, in my personal opinion, I'm not saying any 
particular order or number or where they fit on the Richter scale. But uh, I like the lives of Moses. I like them. None of these men. I mean, they was men's men. They wasn't afraid of nothing. And I, I like Moses. I like that man. I, I really do. I like, I like reading about him. I like the book of Exodus. I like reading about his life. I like to read his writings. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. I like to read them. I love them. And I like to watch Moses. The Bible gives us so many pictures of him. We get to watch him from birth all the way up till he's on that mountain. And, and the angel of the Lord buries him. That's, that's pretty good. We get to, the Holy Ghost writes his biography for us. And we get to watch it. We get to watch him as his mother lays him in that that river there, that Jordan, uh, that uh, Nile River. And we get to watch Miriam as she comes down and watches Pharaoh's daughter and all that transpires there. Forty years in the splendors of Egypt. We get to watch it. He learns all the languages. He's skilled in, in all of their arts and all of that very, very intelligent man. We get to watch him kill that, 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 that Egyptian as he was, you know, afflicting his brethren. And then we get to watch him flee. Man on the run. Hands down to Help his, his, his Jethro, who would, I guess, eventually be his fa- father-in-law. He marries Zipporah. And, and you know all the story there. And from, he goes from the splendors of Egypt to the backside of a wilderness, tending to sheep. And we get to watch all of that. And it's just a beautiful thing. We get to watch him as he comes down, his feet, as to take his shoes off his feet because he's standing in front of that burning, fiery bush. Jehovah speaks out and talks to him. He says, I want you to go down to Egypt and, and free my people. You get to watch all of that. Red Sea crossing. Probably uh, one of the greatest miracles the Bible gives us. Can you imagine being there at that Red Sea crossing and getting to watch that going apart? A whole sea. I mean, I'd, I'd fall apart if it just, I was in the bathtub. And, you know, I mean, I don't know what I'd do. Just, you know, get a drink of water and it split down the middle. Can you imagine this? Which really, that ain't no more. I mean, it's not the same amount of miracle as it is a Red Sea parting, water parting, water parting. We get to watch all of that. We get to watch him as he, as he goes across and the, and the bodies of Pharaoh's army and all of that washes up on the shore. I personally, I think one of the most profound pictures that we have of Moses is when he stands before him with that rod in his hand. That rod, I tell you, I, I'd like to preach on that rod sometime. That's, that's something there. The rod, of course, I believe, it symbolizes a few things. The rod of my staff, it comforts me. The rod of correction. We can, we can use the rod to, to typify a lot of different things. But in a, in a real sense, the rod typifies the Word of God in a very broad and, and general way. I can apply it to the Word of God in many ways of correction and reproof and, and, and those sort of things, the chastisement and different things of that sort. And so we see God tells Moses, test it on the ground, and it turns into a snake. Now, I don't know, you know, you may feel like the only reason God did that was just to, to, to show Moses a sign. But I think there was more to him turning that, st- that stick, that, that, that rod there into a snake. And I'm going to tell you what I think it was. It gave Moses a holy reverence for that rod. <laughs> I mean, he's carrying that rod, brothers and sisters, and he knows there's death inside that rod. He knows there's a fiery serpent inside that rod. And so he handled it just right. I'd like to tell us tonight that I know the Word of God is life. This rod that we carry has got life in it. And I'm going to tell you something else. There's death in it too. And we need to remember that at all times how we hold it, how we carry it, and how we preach it, how we testify, how we talk it, how we sing it. Because yes, there's life in the rod, but there's also death in it. And so he goes down to Moses. To Moses goes down to Pharaoh. He's, he knows there's something about this stick here. It ain't your normal stick. This ain't your normal rod. I mean, he's going to do all sorts of miracles with this rod. But I want you to watch him as he comes down to that river. And he's already cast his rod down. It turned into a snake, eight Pharaoh sorcerer snakes. I mean, it was a beautiful scene there. And he casts his rod. He, 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 he throws it out over top, the, over top the, the river there, and it turns into blood. I mean, turns into blood. Kills the, kills the fish in there, and it, and, and, and it turns into death. It turns into pain. It turns into suffering. It turns into sickness. They couldn't drink the water anymore. Things were dying because the water 
had been turned into blood. Now, I, I want to take you to the book of Revelation quickly. I think it's chapter 11. The Bible tells us about two witnesses that God is going to raise up in the last days. And I'm a little bit torn in between exactly who nobody really knows. I don't know. You don't know. But for a long time, I thought those two witnesses would be Elijah and Enoch. And I have my reasons for thinking that. But then there's another part of me, that the, the, the greater part of me believes it's going to be Elijah and Moses. Now, the reason I say that is because the Bible says that God is going to give them power to turn water into blood, to pray fire down from the sky, and to bring plagues upon the people. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And so we see Moses has the power to change the atmosphere. He's got the power to turn water into wine. He's got the power to bring plagues down. Elijah's got the power to do the same. And so I want you to remember those two men, that the things that God gave them power to do, they brought death. They turned things into death. They brought plagues that changed the atmosphere into death, into pain, into suffering, and into sickness. And that's the power God's going to give give them again in the book of Revelation. Now in the text before us, I'm going to tie all this in here in a little while if the Lord will help me if I can get my mind thinking clear enough. The Bible says that there was a marriage down in Cana of Galilee. There's a marriage going on down there. And, and, and really, we don't know who it is. The Bible doesn't really say who's getting married. Probably some kind of kin to Mary. There's a possibility that she knew him real well. Because if you watch her, she's commanding servants to do this and, and servants to do that. And, and it seems like she's more overzealously concerned about the, the situation that's going on at the marriage. I mean, if I went to a marriage and you ran in a fruit punch, I'd say, so what? But if it was your wedding or if it was your daughter's wedding, you'd probably be a little concerned about the situation. Situation. And so I'm just saying, I think that probably Mary knew these people somehow or another. Well, the Bible tells us that not only was Mary there, but verse 3 says, and when they, or verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. I thought that was real good. If you're going to get married, you need Jesus in the arrangements, don't you? I mean, if you're going to get married, don't you need the Lord at your wedding? And I mean, don't you want to take him back to the house with you? And that would do all of us married men and women some good tonight to know that. That a marriage takes more than two tonight. It's going to take you and her or him. And it's going to take Christ being at the marriage. But you've got to take him home with you. And you've got to let him dictate what you're going to do and how your family is run. Because really, brethren, we're not really the head. He's the head. And we're the under shepherds. I realize I'm the pastor of the church. But really, I'm the under pastor. I am the head of my house, but really, I'm underneath the head, and His name is Jesus Christ. And I found that the only way to have a successful marriage is to have Jesus at the wedding and have Him at the house with you. And everywhere you go, you need to take Jesus with you. It's a wise couple that goes into a marriage, that goes into making a family. It's a wise couple that says we want Jesus in the house with us. It's a wise couple that says, I want Jesus in the house. And if anything, that, 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 that person that you're getting married to, I mean, some are looking to get married. If they're trying to compromise your walk with Jesus, it's time for them to go. I'd rather have Jesus than anything I know. I mean, if I can't be married to you and live in the holiness of God and speak in tongues while I'm finally age, I'm going to find me another man. I'm going to find me another woman. Hey, now I need Jesus, more than I need anything else. Somebody shout, Amen. <laughs> I remember Brother Terry was telling me about a couple that called him up there, was fighting and screaming. Wah! He just went over. He, he they were still going at it. <laughs> he didn't even knock. He just opened up the door and went in and sat down on the couch. They just kept on fighting. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Jesus ain't going to stay in a home like that. He doesn't stay with his mutiny. He's going to be the head of the home or he's not going to be there at all. Somebody shout amen tonight. And so we've got some, some wise people here. They invited Jesus. They invited the disciples. And the Bible tells us that during this wedding, it's usually a seven-day long feast. It ain't like today. We go to a wedding that lasts five hours. Boy, we, we're ready to get out of there. They went for a week. <laughs> You're going to have to get more songs than four, Sarah, if you're going to cover up one of these weddings here. 
I mean, they sang and they ate and they had a wonderful time. And, you know, really they wasn't in a hurry because that guy had a year off. He had a year's vacation just to make her happy. I mean, that's good days. Let's go back to the good old days. What do you say? I mean, that sounds good. And so we got a tragedy, a calamity is going to happen at this wedding. You see, in our day and time, you run out of the soda, uh, you run out of the, the iced tea or whatever, you're going to get by, you just drink a little water. Nobody's going to say much. They may say, man, you ran out. May, you know, they're not going to say a whole lot. But in the Middle East, in, in, East in, the, in this area here, it was a terrible, terrible shame to not be able to supply for your feast. In some, in some places, they'd even find you if you weren't able to, 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 to keep provisions on the table the entire feast. That's pretty stiff, I think. Well, here in the middle of this wedding, they were, they were drinking a little too much. Now, they was. They ran out of wine. And so they come down to Jesus. Mary does. The Bible, I won't make a little mention. You know, all, all this, this Catholic, say, all the time talking about Mary is, 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 is divine. She's deity. They call her the, the mediatrix, the mediator. Christ is the mediator. They say she's a mediatrix. And they use John chapter 2 to prove some of this. Because when they had a need, Mary came and interceded to Jesus for the marriage and the wine issue. But I want to show you here that Jesus couldn't do nothing until she got out of the way. And then the thing that I noticed was like three times, John referred to her. He never used her name. Not one time. When Jesus calls her, He don't call her Mom. He don't call her Mary. And if you remember when He was hanging on the cross... And he was finishing up all his business. He still didn't call her mom and didn't call her Mary. He said, woman, you're just your son. Son, you're your mother there. He was just very distant. You know, son, tonight, Jesus is the only mediator between us and God. Somebody say amen. Mary, she was a good woman, no doubt. I believe Mary's in heaven. And I mean, I give her honor just like I would Simon Peter or the Apostle Paul. But when it comes to me and God, there's only three in the Trinity. There's not no fourth. And Mary's not there. And I believe right here, John is just letting us know, yes, she's a precious lady, but the star of the show isn't Mary. The star of the show is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was it wasn't Mary that turned the water in the wine. It was Jesus that got the job done. How many needs a little wine tonight? I ain't talking about red wine. Some of y'all say, well, what would I I ain't talking about Mad Dog 2020, Brother Johnson. Yeah. Oh, nasty rock. Yeah, yeah, it's good because it's cheap. That's about it. It wasn't good when you're hanging over that toilet. You can your guts out. <laughs> Amen. I need some wine tonight. I need some of that Holy Ghost wine. I need some of that new wine that calls them to stagger out of the upper room there in Acts chapter 2. What do y'all say tonight? I gave up though. I didn't quit drinking. I just changed fountains. I just quit drinking what I used to drink. I'm drinking from a new fountain tonight. And so I'm going to, I'm not talking to you tonight about Holy Ghost anointing. I'm talking to you about Holy Ghost wine. And what we're seeing in this situation is they ran out of wine, but they realize we got to have some wine in this place. And that's what we got to get around here. We got to see a deficiency, and we got to see it in the heart when it's there, and say, Lord, I need you to give us wine again. Instead of getting used to not having it, instead of getting used to not having the power of God, instead of getting accustomed to being without, you need to say, God, fill me up again. Fill me up again. I mean, He baptized them in the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, and they're staggering like drunken men. They're talking in tongues and preaching all over the place, but we find them in Acts chapter 4, and they feel them again. I said they got healed again. They do some of us some good around here. They quit living on last week's blessing. They come to this altar tonight and say, here I am. Feel me up again, oh God. And so they got a dilemma. We need wine. And Mary comes to him, and she says, they have no and he rebukes her. Very mildly. I think respectfully. But he says, woman, what, what, you know, what's that got to do with me? His exact words are, woman, what have I to do with this? He said, mine hour has not yet come. Now, that's, I'll be honest, it's a little difficult passage right there. Not really. 
to pinpoint exactly what he's saying, there, there could be a few different things that he means by this right here. Number one, he says, my hour's not come. And he makes like seven references to his hour. If you remember, he was praying there, that high priestly prayer in St. John. He said, he, said, he said, my hour has come. Glorify your son. And so the main thrust of that, that meaning of the hour is that hour of suffering. There on the cross, his hour of, uh, of temptation, that passion of Christ. And I believe he's also telling this woman, who, who are you to have authority over me? You see, because I saw this same thing when Jesus was left down there in Jerusalem. And he was teaching and he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And the Bible said that Mary and his father, called him his father, came down to just read it for yourself. The mother and father of Jesus came down. But when they addressed Jesus, he said, Woman, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? He didn't read it and talk about Joseph as his father. He was talking about his real father. He wasn't talking about his Father, he was talking about the God of heaven. Somebody shout amen. And I believe that's what he's saying to her in one respect here. Woman, who are you to assert authority over me? I work miracles by the power of God through my Father. My time has not yet come. You don't have an appointment yet. But you see, here's the thing about Jesus. And he does this a lot. And you know, he seems to reject you at first. He said, woman, even the dogs eat from the crumbs which fall, fall underneath the table. But that woman didn't take that as a rejection. She just humbled her heart down and said to the truth, Lord, even the dogs eat from the crumbs and you know, under the master's table. And you know the story there. And so she didn't take it as a rejection because every delay is not a denial tonight. Sometimes God wants to see if you'll press your way through. Sometimes He wants to see if you'll keep on knocking. He wants to see if you'll come back again and again and again because you know they're not the Lord seeking such that will worship Him. And He's looking for some that know that they need Him more than they need anything in this world. And you find all through the Word of God that Jesus is talking about those that He blessed because of their importunity. They kept knocking and they kept beating and they kept saying, Lord, open up. And they kept seeking His face. And He said, they that seek My face will find it. They that knock it will be open. Amen. Would you call on His name tonight. He'll answer you. He'll answer you tonight. I could just go on and on. That one man, the blind man, said, I see him in his tree walking. He could have left that way. And would have rejoiced and said, I've been healed almost. And it would have been great. It been a wonderful testimony, right? You couldn't see nothing from your birth, and now you're seeing me in his trees walking. That's great. That's great. But Jesus isn't in it for good, and He's not in it for better. He's in it for best. He doesn't do anything unless He does it just right. You find those ten lepers come down and Christ, He cleanses all of them. You know what? All ten of them could have went right back the way they were. But one of them said, no, I can't do this. This man just cleansed me. And he went back and he began to worship the Lord. And he said, be thou made whole. I don't know what all that entails. I don't know if fingers grew back. I suppose probably so. I don't know if God did a thing in his heart. Probably all of the above. But what I'm trying to tell you is, you don't have to settle just a little bit. You don't have to settle with the chill down your spine, a cheap thrill. You can have the power of Almighty God, but you've got to be willing to press your way through. We have no wine, she says. He says, Woman, my hour has not yet come. Now, some people would have said, He's just forgetting me. He ain't going to do it. That wasn't what Jesus was doing. He's trying to get her out of his way. He didn't want anything between him and them water pots. He just wanted him and what he was going to do. She sees something in his face. I I don't know. I I mean, I I guess she knew him as good as anybody. I I mean, really. I I have to give her some credit there. She, she She knows this man. And she turns to the servants and says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And she steps aside. Oh, that's the gospel summed up, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole kit and caboodle right there. 
Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I like this. I like this book, and it, and it probably doesn't. It's probably really uh, doesn't mean a whole lot. But in, in this, I, I, I like clear cut things. I like I like instruction and obedience. Instruction and obedience. And you're going to see that here over and over and over. Uh, instruction, obedience. Is it? Uh, it, it tells them in verse six. And there was set there six water pots of stone. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Listen to this. And he saith unto them, Fill the water pots. And they filled them up to the brim. Just that simple, clear cut. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. He said it, they did it. It should be that simple with us in Christ. It should be that simple with us in our walk with God. He says it, we do it. There's a lot I could preach, but I've got a few highlights that I would like to cover before before I close this thing down. I like the I like the way the Bible gives us descriptions, and and and, and particularly what I'm talking about is the Bible says they fill them up to the brim, up to the brim. Now Jesus could have filled them water pots up himself, right? Jesus could have filled them water pots up by himself. He was man enough he could have packed the water himself. He was God enough he could have just filled them up, just spoke them into existence. You can shout amen right there. He could have done it himself. But you see, there's something about God. He likes to work with his people. He likes for you and me to have part in this thing. Now we've got to get out of the way. We can't be in His way, but if we'll get if we'll get in alignment with Him, He'll use us in the work of God. He'll use us to lay hands on people to see the sick here. He'll use us to preach the gospel. He'll use us to, to testify to folks. He'll use us to do so these and, and all sorts of things if we will allow Him to. Now this verse here tells me that these servants weren't lazy. These servants weren't lazy because other people like the day you grab out six or seven people today and say, fill the water pots up. I mean, they fill about halfway up and spill the water out. But these men fill them to the brim. They said, we're going to get, we're going to get, going to get a miracle here. We're going to give it all we got. No half-hearted work here. No, no, no lazy work here. One hundred percent effort. They filled it to the brim. I think it also speaks to us tonight about faith. I think I, I think it speaks to us tonight about the faith that they had in this man. They had no idea what was getting ready to happen, but she said, "Whatsoever he saith, do it." And Jesus is standing there in power and authority. He's got command. They say, "Can feel his presence." I mean, he wasn't just some limp wrist in a feminist city. I'm talking about the most powerful man that ever lived on this earth. The old people knew that something was getting ready to go down at the marriage supper of Cana and Galilee, and they filled them things to the brim. I'm going to tell you something else. God don't use people that are lazy. When He pulled out Paul and Barnabas, Silas, all of He found men that was working, men that was preaching, men that was reaching. I'm telling you, men say, I ain't got no order to preach. They're just liars. they liars. Don't tell me you ain't got nowhere to preach. Street corners all over the place. Nursing homes everywhere. I mean, they they somewhere to preach every night, every day, all day, all night. I mean, you preach 24 hours a day. You want to preach, there's places to preach. But what happens is, is you don't get an offering out there on the street corner. And you don't get your name in the wholeness and farmer out there on the street corner. And you don't get to preach camp meetings when you're preaching on the street corner. As a matter of fact, a lot of them will turn you out and say, we don't believe in all of that. But you know what? Jesus didn't care about all that. He just said, excuse me. I fill the water pots up. It's time to work a miracle around here. And them men that was there, they obeyed His command. Amen. They obeyed His command. He had faith. And so if you want the Lord to use you, we need to get in here and do our best. What do you say? Let's give Him everything we got. One hundred percent of us. Because a hundred percent ain't good enough. I'm just going to tell you. A hundred percent of you ain't, ain't good enough. That's why He sent Jesus. That's why you got to have that Holy Ghost in your heart dwelling there. 
God sees that son of his. He's going to rejoice. He filled him up with the brim, and he saith unto them, Draw out that fat. That fat. Now, I want you to notice who he talked to, when he, who, who he told to draw out. You know? Same people he said, Fill them up. I got a feeling, brother, man. If they hadn't done the job right the first time, he'd got somebody else finished filling them up. And it would have been them that he had said, Draw out. You see, that's the thing about it. We want God to use us. But we so very much want to be, back, be, be dipped down there in a Biathar and a banner. We don't want to be dipped in Jordan like me. You hear me? We don't want to be dipped in the, in the muddy water. But the Lord taught me a long time ago, if you ever go anywhere in God, you've got to go through the furnace of affliction. I get, I get, I, I get worried about some of these young young bucks. I mean, they've been saved about two weeks, and they're already preaching camp meetings and running around fifth wheels and trucks, and I mean, they've got honk for Jesus on the back of them, and they're preaching you know, all over the country. It just, it's just what you do is just set you clock and just wait. They're going to fall. I remember one young man, just for the sake of goodness and niceness tonight, I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> on any other night, I probably would. He, uh, he was one of them uh, firecracker preachers, uh, Fourth of July style, you know. And uh, I remember a guy told me, man, this guy's the greatest preacher ever. Said, yeah? He said, yeah. And I listened to him. He, he preached a little bit. He got this big, massive voice. He could move people. He knew how to make them move. And he said uh, something like this. Throw up one hand and pray for me. Throw up another hand and pray for you or something. And that guy said, stop. You see, hear that? That's what makes a preacher a preacher. And I thought, hmm. Maybe that's why this guy here, uh, this greatest preacher in the world, well, got in all kinds of trouble. And the guy that told me that committed adultery on his wife, and he ain't preaching now. Maybe. Because I'm going to tell you what makes a great preacher. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the anointing of God. Somebody shout amen. That's, that's good preaching right there. If I have to say so myself. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the anointing of God. And you know where that comes from? It comes from, a, a, it comes from an altar. It comes from consecration. It don't come from fancy titles. It don't come from five points in a poem. It comes from a walk with God. And I'm going to go a little further. I know this is a little off the subject. But I just as soon as see a holiness woman walk down through Walmart, that's one of the greatest sermons I've ever seen right there in my life. Just living holy, smiling when things fall apart. When I see people, our family are, are hurt. Instead of falling apart and giving up on God, we, it strengthens our faith and we draw closer to God. That's the kind of people that I want to be around. You know what I'm saying? I want, I want around people that when there's a tragedy, instead of running from Christ, they come to Christ and say, Lord, we're out of whatever it is we're out of. I like to see people. Now, I don't like to see anybody sin. I don't like to see people fall. But I'll take a man that falls and comes back to Jesus with a heart of humility and a head hung low and say, Lord, if you can forgive me a sinner, I'll take that man or that pompous pious preacher any day of the week. The man is coming to Jesus. That's my kind of man right there. You know what a lot of people would have said? They'd have said, oh, we got plenty of wine. And it, it, it's, it's in the back room somewhere. And then, I don't know what they'd have done. They'd done like everybody else. They'd either made a fool or had to go down and steal somebody else's wine. But these people were honest hearted. They said, we're out. We're out. We need more. And Jesus, he's a man that can provide tonight. Did you know that? They drew out. Bear under the governor of the feast, Jesus said, and they bear it. Another command obedience. Draw out now, bear under the governor of the feast, and they bear it. I'm mean, asking a period after the red, a period after the black. Command obedience. God said they did. You got to get that one. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, the servants which drew the water knew. 
the governor of the feast called the bride. Now I got a couple things to say right here. Number one, this does not give you a license to go out and get drunker than Tudor Brown. And I know all of y'all know that. But you get out there preaching on the streets, and you'll hear this right. They don't even know where John chapter 2 is. They look back there in the concordance somewhere. They ain't got no idea what John chapter 2 is. I love it. They say, Judge, and I say, where's that at? That's in Ezekiel. Boy, I can tell you're a Bible scholar. I can tell you're really in there, buddy. <laughs> I, I got a crowd. I tell you, I said, the other night was out there on Ebor City, and God said, Judge, not. I said, is that even in the Bible? He said, yeah. He said, well, I said, where's that at? He said, it's either in Colossians or Romans. He said, no, it's not. He says, Matthew chapter 7. No, it isn't. He said, yes, it is. No, it isn't. He said, I'll make a deal with you. If I'm wrong, I'll never preach again. I'll never preach again the rest of my entire life. I said, but if I'm right, you've got to fall on your face right here, right now. And repent before God. He got pale. He said, well. He said, I'll leave the streets. I said, no. I said, you know so much about the Bible? Let's talk about this. I said, if it's in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, you got to repent. So I just opened it up. I flipped it around, let him look at it. And that Bible I'm preaching out of tonight. And he said, oh. He said, I'm wrong. I said, you sure are. They have no idea where it's at. And they'll say, Jesus turned the water into wine. I was studying that today. Number one, this word wine here in the Greek is oinos. And you can't prove either one with it. It just means wine. It don't mean ferment or unferment. Furthermore, the best wine was hardly had any alcohol in it at all. Uh, what, sometimes they would put 20 to 1, the wine to water. By the time, and, and it was only for preservative, Brother Johnson. In the Middle East, they got no ice. They got no refrigerators. And by the time they hit that wine 20 to 1 in water, there was, no, there was no alcohol content in it. I don't care how you slice it or dice it. I don't care what way you come at this Scripture right here. The only way you're going to find alcoholic beverage anywhere missing is when it talks about strong wine, strong drink. Different places like that. What I'm saying is about Jesus Christ, you're not going to find one place that you can use to say that it's all right to drink. There's not a place in the Scripture. I can take the Bible and show you every angle. There's no way to prove that. I'm going to tell you something else, saints of God. It takes a real desperate person to pull out something like that to try to justify getting drunk. And I'd like to say there's no sipping saints tonight. You hear me? <laughs> Hey, man, just thought I'd throw that in there. Second thing that I'd like to tell you tonight is I'd rather be a servant and know the source as the governor and not know the source. You hear me? I'm going to tell you why I said that. Right here, verse 9. And I hope you all didn't misunderstand me. I'm just talking about wine tonight. I'm telling you, folks don't know what they think they know. All right? Most of the wine, they've drunk it. I mean, we've got a picture of them running around drunk all the time. They wasn't drunks. The Bible strictly forbid that. It was strictly forbidden. I mean, you think the high priest and her drinking getting drunk? No. When they did, God killed them. I'm just telling you, the wine mentioned in the Word of God was not intoxicating alcohol. And a lot of it was new wine, Brother Johnson. You know what new wine is? They took the grape and squeezed it into a cup. Yeah, it's new wine. That's Welch's grape juice, brother. Fermented wine only has 2.5% alcohol in it anyway. In America, it's got to be 3.7 or something, I think, to be, what is 3. Point something to be legally intoxicating. There's no wine mentioned at all, even the alcohol kind. Noah got drunk on about 2.5 2. or something. <laughs> he hadn't drunk a whole lot, you know. i got to quit preaching here tonight. I feel good. Y'all with me tonight? I don't know when I'm going to get done, but I'm on my, I think I'm almost done. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. Listen to what it says. And knew not whence it was, but the servants was true. The water they knew. They knew the source. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Listen to what it says, verse 10. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. 
there's, there's a lot in this passage. And I tell you something I saw here that I hadn't seen before. That's what the world does right there. You, maybe you young folk can listen to me. The devil always gives you the best first. I mean, he paints a real good picture. He'll lure you in. I was listening today to a preacher, and he was talking about a young girl. She had rebelled against her mom and dad. There's two of them, actually, 18 year old. She hit the road jack, said, I ain't coming back. And uh, dad was mean, you know. Dad wouldn't let her date whoever she wanted to, and, uh, and he was trying to put a stop to it, is what it was. He had allowed it. The dating game, date this one, date that one, date this one, date that one, this girlfriend, and got herself in all kinds of a mess and more and moral trouble and, and all sorts of stuff, and he tried to put his foot down and she left the house. Well, she starts telling him, you know, I can't make it out here. You know, you get out and sin, you think you're going to make a million dollars, you ain't going to. You're probably going to fall flat on your face. I hope you do. And so she got out there and got her little job and didn't make enough money to make the ends meet. And so she's complaining to her dad. And then this, 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 this slick Willie comes by. And he says, what are, you, what are you worried about a job for? I'll give you a job making $10, $12 an hour. And she says, all right. So she, 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 she yokes up with this guy. Next day she calls her dad and said, Dad, you're never going to believe this. But that guy that I was talking to said he took me out today and showed to the car lot and said he's going to buy me a brand new car. About, he, he warned her. He felt burden in his heart. He said, you're in trouble. You need to get away from that guy. She said, oh, no, Dad. He's a really nice guy. He's a really great guy. Two weeks later, she calls him and they talk. And she says, Dad, you're never going to believe it. He took me out house shopping today. Now, you men, I don't know about you, but red flag. I'd have probably tracked him down. I'd have already had his number. I'd already been on his door. He had a, this, this father had a, a brother, I think it was, who was a deputy. Maybe he worked in the, in the police department. He gave the man, he gave his brother, this deputy, his, this man's name. The next day he called him up and said, hey, Bob, he said, I, we may ought to talk. He said, the guy, he gave me the name, he said, I got a few things I'll tell you. He said, I think I better come over and show you in person. And he came over to his brother's house. He said, I think I want the girl there too, his, his niece. Got them both together the next night. Sat down. This girl was just going on to Uncle about how great this guy was and how he offered her a job and was going to buy her a car and buy her a house and buy her this. And, and Uncle pulled out a rap sheet about that long. The most predominant crime that he had been in trouble for was child sexual molestation. Uncle told her, said, we just raided that man's house a while back. I guess he was on, had posted bail. He said, we found in his basement a mattress. We found women's clothes everywhere. We found leather straps. This man was going to abduct her. This man was going to bind her and was probably going to end up killing her. She's only a couple of days away, a couple of moments away. And that's what happens to you when you get out of the house. I have no idea why I told that story, but you've got it anyway. That's what sin does to you. You know, it looks good. That's where I'm at. It looks good. It's enticing. And things look well. The enemy always offers you the best first. And he lures you in. And once he snaps you in, he will mistreat you. He will abuse you. He will make you his slave. And when it's all said and done, you're saying where all the, the promises go. And the enemy's laughing in your face and saying, you're a fool. Why would you ever believe me? It's like that Indian up on that mountain. That snake, he found the snake there about froze. Snake said, please pick me up. Warm me up. God picked him up and rubbed him, you know, and pulled him up close to his bosom. Snake unfold. Rattlesnake bit him. He lay in there about to die. He said, you bit me. He said, I'm a snake. That's what I do. It's sin. That's what it does. The enemy always offers the best. Best of his God tries to lure you in. I could preach more there, but that's what I really wanted to say about that subject. Verse 11, the beginning of this beginning of miracles that Jesus in Cana of Galilee. First to 35. First to 35. There's a lot in that. I just scratched the surface tonight. 
I read that passage. I began to look at all the things that were going on. And my heart just, I, lo- I love this passage of Scripture anyway. I'm going to share this with you. This is my message tonight. And we'll go home. I think the greatest miracle in this passage is not the wine. It's not turning the water into wine. I think, I think the key lesson taught in this passage is that Christ has got the power to transform. I think, I think that's the key, Brother Johnson. I don't think that water is very important. I don't think that that literal wine was very important. But I think tonight that the power of Christ to transform, I believe that that is very important. How many have been transformed by the power of God? I mean, we watch Jesus transform all sorts of stuff naturally. He can walk out on a sea that's, that's just rough and the wind's blowing and storms upon it. And He can just speak, peace be still. And He transforms nature. And nature just lays down before Him and obeys everything that He says. I'll tell you the greatest transformation that ever took place was when He came by my house about 14 years ago. And there I was drunk. I mean, I was a sinner. I was on my way to hell. And Jesus was just His Word. He turned the water into wine. Somebody shout Amen. Here's what I want to tell you. Moses turned water into death. Moses turned water into pain. He turned it into sickness. But Jesus turned the water into wine. He turned it into joy. He turned it into happiness. He turned it into myrrh. And He turned it into gladness. Amen. Isn't that what He did for you? He took a heart that was a a torn a piece of my skin. He took a black heart that was corrupted. And He smoked over it. And the blood washed it. And He turned your heart into joy. He took those old garments of sadness and gloom and gave us garments of praise. I'm talking about He that can turn the water into wine tonight. You can stand me across the house. I wanted to preach a little while tonight on Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Be not, well, 2, 3, 2. He said, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Be not cut to the pattern of this world. But he said, be transformed. Be renewed by the trans. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And uh, maybe I'll just I'll just share this with you. Uh, uh, it's important tonight that our minds are captivated upon Christ. This word "transform" here it's an important word for me. I wasn't raised up in a holiness family. I was raised up around Pentecost. I was raised up around people. That went to church. I spent a lot of my adolescence in sin, as did most of us in this house. I could not begin to tell you the things that the enemy brings before my mind sometimes. The past. And you may have gotten victory over this, and that's great. And, I, and the Lord has helped me. I'm going to share how He helped me. Such a grace approach me. This is one of these verses that, that helped change me. And I'd try to pray, and the enemy would bring up past, and I would feel terrible shame for sins I've committed in the past. But the Apostle Paul said, But be ye transformed. Be ye metamorphosed from one thing into another. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I began to, to study and meditate on that passage. And it speaks to us of this. It says that what you were, you no longer have to be. The way of thinking that you used to think, it must be transformed. And I can guarantee you that all your memories will not fade away. <laughs> I, had a young, I had a young preacher come to me a couple of years ago. And, man, he lived a real rough life, too, in sin. 
And he said, Brother Lamb, he said, when will this ever go away? When will, this, when, when will these memories, when will, when will they ever be erased? And normally, you know, you want to tell somebody, oh, brother, about the two-year mark, you know. They just all fade away. But I've been saved 13 years. And I've had to fast for weeks at a time. God help me. And does anybody understand what I'm saying tonight? I'm not talking about wanting to go back out in the world. Do you understand me? I'm talking about that monkey on your shoulder. The enemy wants to get on you, you know. And he wants to say, you can't preach. You remember what you did. You, you can't pass. How can you tell them anything after what you did? And uh, that's not the real bad part. The real bad part is when you start doing things. But God showed me. He done showed me that we can bring our thoughts into captivity. And it's not easy. It's one of the hardest things that I know of. And it's not just sin. That's just how I introduced this concept tonight. Sickness. Pain. Loss. The enemy torments our mind over a million things. Loneliness. A feeling of worthlessness haunts you like an old hound dog on your trail. We cannot allow those things to torment us. Here's my advice to you. Number one, by faith, you need to tell the enemy I'm saved and I belong to God. Number one, you have no claims to me. I don't belong to you anymore. The things that I used to do, I no longer do. The things that I used to be, I am no longer that. Number one, I belong to God. I may be sick, but I serve a healer. You need to keep reminding Him of that. I'll tell you something else. You need to keep reminding yourself of that. God isn't through with me yet. You have to talk to yourself sometimes. You have to reason with yourself. Number two, you need to take the Word of God and apply it to your life. You need to read the Word of God. You need to study the Word of God. And you need to pray. And you've got to say, God, help me bring these thoughts into captivity. I'm tired of running around here with these things on my heart. I'm tired of being beat down. I'm tired of hearing the devil say, you're never going to make it. i got news for the devil. The devil didn't pull me out of that world. The devil's not my father. He's not calling the shots in my life. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And I think it's time to put Him in His rightful place and let the Lord transform your mind tonight. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We thank You for Your mercy and grace. I honor You and I praise You for the anointing I felt in the house. I pray that the Word of the Lord will be effectual, that it will pierce hearts tonight, and that hearts will be encouraged and lifted. We're not playing with some weak God. We're not, we're not praying to some God of wood or stone, or some God of hay or stubble. We're praying to Jehovah. We're coming to You tonight, Lord, who's got power not only to turn water into wine, but You've got power to turn a desperate situation into rejoicing. You've got the power to turn darkness into light. You've got power to speak to a storm and make the storms lay silent in the sunshine of death. We're calling out to You, O oh God, that's got power over all all the power of the enemy. We come to You tonight and I pray for those that the enemy has been tormenting their minds that they see a view of You tonight. They get a picture of He that is able to turn it around. I pray that You transform their minds tonight and give them clarity of thought and let them realize more than ever that they're children of the King. They've got royal blood flowing through their veins and the enemy can no longer have stake, no longer have part. I belong to God. And He can turn this thing on a dime. Is that a word? Is that a thought? And that's the God I serve. I pray God impress the message in the heart of you people tonight. 
that whatever they're going through, whatever the problem, whatever it is they're battling right now, you can change that. You can change that. My prayer is tonight some desperate souls would come before you and say, Lord, I need wine. I need healing wine. I need comforting wine. I need the Holy Ghost to comfort me, to walk beside me. I need you to speak into my heart peace and calm the storm. Help me see me as you see me. Father, I pray over this altar call tonight. Touch hearts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Somebody holler amen. These altars are open. Praise God, praise God, for I'm a child. 
Oh 